Hello. Hello, my dear friends. I'm Steffi Chani. I'm your DLD host today. Today, I have the special honor to welcome two superstars in their respective fields to discuss Europe's digital competitiveness. To my regard, it's an extremely crucial topic. We really have to address it in many, many parts and many views. And we have to continue to power Europe in our mind. Both are confident advocates of thriving digital Europe between the superpowers US and China. Please welcome my good friend Klaus Hommel, founder and managing director of Zurich-based VC fund Lakestar, and a much respected investor with impressive track record in leading digital and technology companies. Klaus is an important voice in the European digital economy and a member, a founding member, member of the Foundation Council of the Internet Economy Foundation. Klaus has first sp spoken at DLD in 2010. Now we have 2020, so 10 years ago. And he has been a very loyal friend and supporter of the DLD conference since then. As an industry in, um, counterpart, of Klaus, I'm so proud to welcome my good old friend Stefan Oschmann, CEO of the Merck Group based in Darmstadt, Germany. Stefan leads a global company with a 350 year legacy, which is driven by a love, it's in their, um, in their, of their never, by a love of science and a passion for technology active in the fields of healthcare, life science, and performance materials, performance materials. Stefan is driven by entrepreneurial thinking and curious view on how Europe, European companies can operate successfully on a global level. When you think, oh, she, she was holpering, she was, I tell you why, because Stefan, I stolpered on the word curious. Stefan is one of the most curious, curious people I've ever met. He is so curious in so many fields. He is a humanist. He is very ironic. Sometimes I'm a little bit afraid of his irony, but he is an amazing guy and you all should know him better. Stefan has first spoken at DLD in 2009 and I'm proud to have him as a supporter and friend of the DLD community. The conversation will be led um, by Sebastian Mattes, deputy editor in chief of influential business paper Handelsblatt, who has deep insight into the European digital innovation ecosystem. Needless to say, Sebastian is also a long term friend of DLD and supporter too. I know him since his day at Burda as editor in chief of the Huffington Post in Germany. Now, Sebastian, Klaus, and Stefan, I'm proud that you are here and the floor is now open for your discussion. Thank you so much, Steffi, for these nice words. And I'm actually happy to be on stage again, at least on a virtual stage at DLD. Great what you guys built here. And um, I'm very happy to have two uh, like really visionary tech experts here today to discuss this very important topic. The question um, about the future of the European tech ecosystem after Corona. So um, just to set the stage, uh, my first question uh, question to both of you, will Europe be a hotspot or will it be a not spot when it comes to technology after Corona? Just give me, let's say one sentence, please, Stefan, what do you think? In the area which I uh, understand well, and that is biotech, I think that Europe will be a, uh, will be a hotspot and I leave uh, digital platforms and so on to, uh, to Klaus Hommels. So Klaus. So, <clears throat> so hope does last. And I do think there's no option of not becoming a hotspot because it will, as we see, it drives so many situations and, 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 and important processes in life and in political life in Europe that we need to get it right. So before we um, go deeper into that, um, let's uh, go one step back. And um, Stefan, what was the moment um, you thought 
this uh, corona crisis will be something bigger than everybody thought. I've, from what I understand, Merck um, has seen pretty early that something was going on. Well, we went into uh, at least sort of behind the scenes into a crisis, a crisis mode in the third week of January, and uh, we had we we had uh, identified three priorities to protect the safety and health of our employees and their families, business continuity and early recovery, and then to be an active player in combating, in combating this uh, uh, this pandemic. Mm. I was in a way lucky to have been exposed to this uh, pandemic preparedness thinking since many years and there were quite a few people who've been communicating very actively the thought leader being uh, being uh, Bill Gates so uh, to me this came not completely as a surprise if you ask me were you really properly prepared I would say no okay Klaus what was the moment when you realized what was going on Look, as you, as you can see, tech hasn't been um, uh, at the forefront of being affected. So I have to say I'm got aware of it as the normal process, as every normal citizen got aware of it through mass media um, before it then had repercussions on our tech portfolios. Okay. And um, Stefan, a couple of weeks ago, you said it will take um, at least 18 months until we have a corona vaccine. If we are lucky, Merck is also doing research in that field. 18 months, is that still what you expect? Well, so so Merck, uh, Merck has different businesses through our life science business. We're working with 45 vaccine projects. And we su mm -hmm. we're supporting these and we're setting up the process. You have all the insights we know, need to know now. So uh, what I was saying was that if we are super lucky, we may have a vaccine later this year. Mm. Uh, if we are just lucky, we may have a vaccine around this time next year. Today, Moderna, a US company, has published phase one data that are, re that are really very promising. You know, they, uh, they seem to have full zero conversion. It's a totally new technology. It's called mRNA. I'm not, don't be afraid. I'm not going to go into details, but it's, an, it's a sort of re revolutionary new technology. And there are two German companies, CureVac, in Tübingen and uh, and BioNTech in Mainz, who are also leaders in this in this area. So I'm I'm optimistic about vaccines. At the same time, we must we must be aware of the fact that if we have a vaccine, it will not be used in mass uh, administration early on. Now, if this was a disease like Ebola or so that kills 50 or 60 percent of the people who get infected, that's a totally different story. But this, uh, this virus causes a mortality, let's say, between, I don't know, 0.5 and 5%. So you need to be really sure that, that such a vaccine is properly tested. So the time we have a vaccine, it will be used initially in high-risk populations. Okay. And so, so we have to realize this, will, this whole situation will go on for a pretty long time. So I would like to talk about the time... Um, um, what's happening after this whole crisis might be over. So how will the tech scene have changed in, let's say, 12 or 18 months, Klaus? What do you expect? How, what do you see now and what do you expect will happen then? What, what business model will get stronger and w which will maybe fade out? So what is your expectation? Well, <clears throat> so in general, I cluster... I identify three clusters. So there are the companies that would have survived without Corona, so they probably won't survive now as well. Then you have a group of companies that profit from Corona, meaning like the uh, digital education, digital health, the Zooms of the world. And then there is this bracket in the middle, which had a functioning business model before Corona was there. Uh, and now they like, like a get your guide or others that do not have a functioning business currently, but it will come back. And the digital infrastructures allow these companies to, uh, re to, to react very quickly on, on, on these changes, meaning stop, um, stop marketing right away, go into product development and uh, really uh, foster and strengthen the advantages of technology. And when then everything opens up again, these will win these companies, and they will win at the cost of the incumbents and, and of offline players. So um, <clears throat> so structurally, I think tech, as we can see that already in, in public markets, is holding very strongly against it. So it is the asset class of choice right now. 
And, so, um, so Klaus, could you, could you give some examples for, for companies that you see the, or expect this kind of development? So, well, look, I mean, the Zooms, they had 10 million concurrent users in we December. We all talked about Zoom, Zoom sure. Mm -hmm. In the vicinity, yeah. So, and then you have uh, platform businesses like um, Glovo. <clears throat> so, I do believe there is a new cohort being minted right now. So, there are a lot of people that were like uh, reluctant to get into this digital business are now forced into the digital business. We see some businesses like the Nebenans, the Glovos, where cohorts are currently onboarding these businesses that do not have customer acquisition costs because you get forced into it. Mm -hmm. And these are very high qualitative users as well because they suddenly take the advantages of these or understand the advantages of these businesses and become very loyal and long-lasting customers. So in terms of cohort analysis, no customer acquisition costs or fraction and very life, long lifetime and loyal customers. So that is something that is completely new. Um, so you think, uh, Klaus, tech will become stronger in this crisis in many fields? So tech is a chance? For tech, yeah, the crisis um, so is a chance? They are by, by nature. So if you compare any vertical uh, <clears throat> which where tech fights with the incumbent, the incumbent is way more vulnerable in, in having more fixed costs and um, cannot react so much and cannot play the scale of technology. So I think in most cases, technology does have a clear um, clear advantage and it and also it rebounds when we look through our portfolio, mm -hmm. rebounds back very quickly. We're going to talk about um, tech fields in a minute that um, will develop uh, more quickly maybe. Um, but before that, Stefan, I would like, um, I've read an op-ed um, from you in Handelsblatt a couple of weeks ago. You wrote um, that the COVID crisis could be a chance. Is it also a chance for a push for the European tech ecosystem? And do you see this push already happening? I see a, a significant change in uh, in attitudes. You know, I've... Uh, I've been contacted but by quite a few heads of government, ministers, etc. lately. Mm -hmm. it's, for instance, I mean, we as a company, we define vaccine uh, production processes and so on. And European leaders that were not really so interested in such things are suddenly very interested. European leaders are suddenly very interested in having a thriving biotech scene and ask mm -hmm. about what are the what are the success factors? How can we have a, a, a an innovation ecosystem uh, that uh, that could uh, that could really work? And there are many other aspects that are all of a sudden important. We also we, we also we, we are the world's leading company when it comes to electronic materials. So all the things, all the materials you need for chip making, and we see that this business is booming right now. As many of the law, at least the large tech companies, are understanding that software isn't a decisive factor anymore given given how chip design works these days and they're going into uh, and, they, and they're very active and apple has been doing that since quite some time google etc they're very active in in chip design and i see that among european leaders that they understand that we in, in order to have some degree of autonomy in europe that we also uh, uh, need to strengthen our hardware base mm. Let's for a minute go back to the to the biotech startups because uh, for years I've I've um, read um, articles on um, um, scientists leaving Germany, going to the United States, um, um, big um, biotech clusters um, are, were developing um, in, around Boston, for example. Um, so, um, um, do you think this interest in the biotech scene is sustainable now, or is it only now in the crisis and in a couple of uh, let's say two years or so, uh, they will be forgotten again. Because to be honest, in the last years, nobody really uh, was interested in them, right? Well, you know, that's let's say in the public media. But the, you know, the, if you look at the investment levels from uh, from venture capital, from uh, from uh, family offices and corporate B, uh, corporate VCs into biotech, that's at a very high level. So I I expect that this will continue to be uh, to be thriving going forward we have some issues right now in the crisis you know it's it's especially for european companies it's not uh, it's not easy to find uh, to find funding the us and china exactly. and in the united states it's easier so so many companies 
are leaving or scientists are leaving because so. yeah we've seen we've seen this brain drain thing but but quite a few I mean. scientists have left china to don't underestimate china there is a there is a thriving biotech scene in uh, in china if you look at technologies like car t gene therapy china is becoming the uh, the major the major force europe has a pretty good academic base so we, mm -hmm. have, we have very good academic institutions we have like in germany we have uh, we have some corporate investors like us and we have we have uh, successful investors like thomas and andreas strungmann like uh, uh, like mr hop and it's not surprising that for instance right now if you look at this mrna technology that is kind of the hottest technology in this whole thing that two out of three leading companies uh, uh, are uh, are germany based if you if you just look at the market cap of biontech biontech has a market cap of uh, uh, of 12 billion very shortly mm -hmm. uh, very shortly after the ipo so that's a very promising area but they didn't uh, they didn't go public in germany yeah but they're headquartered they're headquartered in germany uh, they have much mm -hmm. of their science space in germany but you know, any biotech company today is global mm -hmm. sure so um Anyway, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. Sebastian, because I think the the beauty of this BioNTech and CureVac example for me is that everybody understood how important it is that we have these companies and that they are basically European financed, so that you have an uh, autonomy here in Europe, um, so that you breed these kind of companies. And I do believe that it's very important that we understand that 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 we do need to finance the innovation so that it stays European and contributes to the wealth of Europe in several years. And um, so you, you see also um, that we, we, can, we do need to be a little bit more proud of, of doing our stuff here in Europe. And we, we can be proud because, for, for example, the, the, health, the health, health packages that we designed, they are very pretty powerful. And uh, in these kind of times, the cultural mindset we have in Europe yeah, clearly allows that you also have a downside protection and not only an upside, uh, optimizing the upside. And then if it starts to rain, then you suddenly have in no time 36 million unemployed. Yeah, so we have a, a very, very, very cool standoff portal in, in Germany. Sure. We need to market that. And for me, I would wish that everybody also in politics understands that we need to build the middle stand for in 20, for in 20 years. And that for me requires massive more funding into growth for this technology, be it tech or be it biotech, yeah, and a smart regulation vis-a-vis -vis, um, big big companies that try to cross integrate their their platform businesses and make it a little bit difficult one time sometimes to for small smaller startups. But before we can build the um, new Mittelstand, the Mittelstand of the future, we have to understand what our um, strengths are. So this is what I would like to do with you and I. Now let's let's talk about because when we look into the world, we we have these two tech superpowers, China and the U.S., and there is a big battle going on on um, several tech fields. And I always wonder what could the role of Europe be. So this is what I would like to discuss with you now. What are the tech fields you feel um, Europe could play a, a major role, um, not even against US and China? Is there Are there things only Europe can do or Europe can do better than everybody else? This would be interesting. I mean, maybe Stefan, maybe you start. Well, I was with a government delegation in Israel lately and we have a long history in Israel. We as a company, we're operating there since uh, more than 50 years and we have close relationship with the Weizmann Institute and Hebrew University and on the way back from Israel uh, uh, Government representatives asked me. So what do we learn? What do we learn from Israel? Because yes, there's the US there's China They're really really uh, successful and powerful in innovation, but there are examples like Israel or Estonia or Korea who are small or uh, medium-sized countries who've also developed an innovation ecosystem that works and that applies both to the data and digital field as well as to biotech and, and hardware uh, and so on. And what I, what I see in these countries is that you have an early uh, cooperation based on a clear government policy between academia, public sector, venture capital and uh, corporates and that you often also have 
the military involved. I mean, look at uh, the history of Silicon Valley. That was really uh, 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 th that was really the military that uh, that got that uh, that got that started. Mm. Where Europe could, from my point of view, where Europe would have an inherent strength is again in the health area. We have health, we have a healthcare system that is in most European countries somewhat centralized. We should have access to healthcare data. Obviously, we need to protect. Uh, uh, data privacy, data sovereignty, and so on. But we could actually, by making these data available in a uh, in a uh, in an appropriate in an appropriate way, we could create a really big advantage uh, for Europe. I'm sure you you do you are involved in discussions on the European in the European Union in in, in the with the German government. So how 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 are the discussions going at the moment? Because it's not a completely new idea, and I'm I'm with you. That's that would be great because. Um, This would help to digitize the whole health sector. You know, we have we have some very simple uh, uh, challenges. For instance, the public the public health sector. There's a lot of variability uh, in in Europe. You know, what we would call Gesundheitsamt in Germany. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that is, you know, that was underfunded, and it's not it's not digitized. You know, uh, some basic infrastructure investment in areas like this. Had we had this plus a couple of other measures. We might not have uh, needed to go into uh, into a lockdown. Or if you look at this lengthy discussion about a contact uh, a contact tracking uh, uh, app uh, and all these different views uh, that are sometimes, from my point of view, overly aesthetic, uh, you know, that, that we, we can we can make progress fairly fairly easily on this. Uh, when I look into um, how this whole uh, uh, contact tracing app in Germany, the discussion went, I I don't believe we will play a big role in digitizing the health sector. Anyway, um, Klaus, what what do you think? What are the strengths of Europe? What what are the tech fields Europe could be major play a major role in? Well, look, I've, we do have 1,500 world market leaders in Mittelstand in in in, in certain sectors and. As Mr. Oshman pointed out, you're very strong in academia. Um, I just and uh, lately, socially entrepreneurship has become way more uh, an, an aspiration among young um, people and young academics. So, but uh, we haven't had a decent funding environment, and it's sometimes it takes some time. You're you're developing the future, meaning not everything is logic. You have to give them not enough money to try out until uh, uh, an idea is viable or not. So mm. look, the, the biggest companies that we have in Europe, like Spotify or Zalando, they just existed because they had special financing situation. Yeah? So Tengelmann put very early on a lot of money into Zalando when everybody was thinking, what did they smoke? Uh, that to put a 20 million and a 200 valuation that early on. Or Spotify, they are just were lucky that they were second-time entrepreneurs and could start finance the first five, six, seven million themselves. So if that hadn't been the case, uh, these two together would have uh, roughly now 40 billion market cap that didn't exist. Yeah, so I do believe that um, at the end, it's a portfolio analysis. Yeah, So mm. you have to structurally provide more, um, more means to develop or to discover the future. Can I have still a try to change in regulation mm -hmm. lately in two European countries, the Netherlands and France? You know, we have we have financial regulation, financial legislation in Europe that makes it very difficult for for certain types of institutional investors to go into venture, insurances, other uh, other areas that have, that have obligations to invest in in I don't know government bonds or, or, or something. The Netherlands and France have piloted this and it's it's amazing to see how fast venture capital grows if the regulatory environment changes so what would be your idea for germany what would you um what would you call for maybe klaus you know more about the specific regulation but there is there are regulations for for uh, institutional investors that could easily be ch uh, easily be changed so that we have that we have more venture venture capital And your know, venture capital is nothing risky. It's risky with, with, with regard to one specific investment. It's not more risky than other investments if you if you have a basket approach to this. And if you look at the corporate venture funds, 
For instance, we have in our company, we have a venture fund that we started, I think, 15, 15 years ago. We have extremely good returns on that. So, like, I mean, I would buy arguments that say, look, basically, uh, in, two, in the 2000s, yeah, the, the, the performance was questionable or uh, didn't meet expectation. But um, if you look at the European Investment Fund that has a structural mandate to invest in venture and meaning not doing a, a selection, but rather if there is a new venture fund in Poland or Slovakia or Slovenia, they invest in these. And if you ask them, they said, we tried heavily to lose money, but we didn't succeed. Uh, and um, on a fund of fund portfolio, yeah, they basically have a pretty decent standard deviation and have a yield in the 2012 or 13 vintage of like 11, 13 percent IIR. So if you look at the, if you take this data and then you go into the regulation for insurances, insurances, they have to calculate with a normal statistical model to underpin investments in venture with the least performing 0.5 percentile that may happen in a, any given standard deviation that they calculate, meaning or resulting in 50% equity uh, to, to underpin it with 50% equity. So this is this this doesn't make it attractive. And um, if you adopted these kind of regulation, I um, think there are a lot of uh, direct advantages, also indirect advantages that that will uh, that are fostered through this kind of of, of initiatives. For me, the big of is Israel. You know, Israel has a chief scientist at cabinet level. That's an ex venture uh, person. Or if you look at Israeli universities uh, or, or research institutions, Hebrew University has such an active uh, uh, tech transfer uh, agenda. At Hebrew University, sometimes art, art historians create uh, create startups. Uh, it's sort of normal for any professor. Uh, uh, at Hebrew University to uh, uh, to uh, engage in a, in a business builder. The Weizmann Institute has been super successful with regard to this. I see some progress in our academic institutions. They are high quality, but there was a little bit of old type, old style uh, thinking uh, before, as if uh, you know, getting into uh, uh, getting into tech transfer was something that was uh, not acceptable. That is hopefully changing. I hope that it's going to change faster. But so when we maybe we have to work a little bit on the perception, uh, so venture capital. So I, I don't uh, and and and, and startups. Uh, so it's not that you buy a Mac, go to So House, order an avocado toast with a fried egg on it, and say I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. So that's not what it is. Yeah. So it is a hard life. You bet your your career on on for six or five or six years on the say on, on one trick pony, but. The effects are humongous if you take the numbers. So the U.S. invested 870 billion in venture since 1995. So the outcome is something like six trillion market cap, which is roughly 33 percent of the GDP. Yeah. So two. So two. 11 percent of the work uh, of the employees are in venture fund companies, but and 44 percent of the entire F&D. Uh, is do, are currently done by venture founded companies. If you take the same numbers in Germany, so it's not that we have 34 or 33% of GDP through venture companies, but we have one and a half. So meaning in 23 years, the delta um, of this of these bows of this uh, uh, is, is exactly one time ducks. So this is what um, what um, venture created for the US as a back, and it's always become a big backbone of of the industry, um, and and we didn't fa we did fail so far, so we have to to really take that serious. Okay, but when we when we talk about money, uh, we are in a situation where we have more money in the world than ever before, and um, there's is more money being produced every day. So and and VCs um, are heavily funded and so on and so forth. And from what I hear uh, in in Europe, um, all the good ideas and in Germany, all the good ideas are more or less getting funding. So is it really a money problem because there's enough money in the world or is it an idea problem that we don't have enough great ideas that have a chance um, against the competitors in china and the us klaus look i mean <clears throat> so the last years have been way more efficient in creating big companies if you take the cadence in which 
uh, unicorns have been built. And if you take the valuation they have now, so ever more companies have been built and all ever bigger valuations there. Yeah. So, but the, you have to distinguish between early and growth. Yeah? So I do, I, I'm really heavily advocating that we do need to fund the growth companies ourselves. So otherwise, we do not happen. Just give you an idea. So like two years back, we did an analysis, which of the big pl platform businesses that had not been listed yet, the, they raised, um, to the 25 platform businesses, they raised something like 64 billion in eight years. Yeah, German or European companies took part in 14% of the financing rounds. They invested 1.9% of the capital and are represented with 1.4% in the cap tables. So, yeah, so you can say, look, they got financed, but uh, if you say German uh, Europe should have a self-esteem and, and, uh, and be proud and should play a role in this, then well, by every metrics you make, inhabitants, GDP, we should be yeah, uh, in a punchline of something like 20, 25%, and we happen with 1.4%. I think that is clearly under representing what we are, and that is something which needs to only be, can only be repaired by um, being able to take part in, in cap tables of very successful companies. Stefan, what do you think? Is there enough money in the world? And well, do we need more European world, money? In the world, yes. And specifically in Europe, let's say in biotech, there is okay seed money. And also when, when Series A are run or so, this is, usually, this is usually also okay. Let's say in my field, a Series A would be an individual investor would kick in 10 million or so and a, a, and a series B would be 50 to 100 or so what is really what is really lacking is uh, is growth is growth money but money is one thing I think that actually there are plenty of good ideas in Europe and there are plenty of good people in academia and in many other uh, in, in many other areas what is lacking is a dedicated government policy and a coherent, innovation ecosystem in which people cooperate without borders, without mm. saying, oh, this is private sector, this is public sector, this is academia, this is... Uh, how could, that, how could that look like exactly? Because it's not completely new, the idea. So, so let's try to show how this could look like. Is that something you've seen in Israel and we could learn from? What, what do you think of? Yeah, so, so Israel for me is a, is, a, is a very, very good example. You know, uh, we need we, uh, uh, we need uh, a government needs to make it clear that this is a high priority. Uh, uh, it doesn't take a lot of government money. Also, the Israeli government doesn't invest big time, but they they do invest early. They they encourage people to come there with incubators. They they provide the the backbone so that you have IP experts. It's it's uh, etc. Et so, so it's the it's about the basic infrastructure. And, uh, and that works very well and I think could be relatively easily replicated uh, in, in Europe and in Germany. What uh, another important negative factor is the is, is competition policy in Europe. You know we had uh, we have a competition policy that has one single uh, one single uh, priority and that is low consumer prices. And uh, we see that other countries, Especially the U.S. and uh, China, anyway, and, the, uh, and 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 Korea, and so on, have a very different approach. Where they, when they look at the market definition, they look at a world market, and not just about a potential dominant position in the uh, in the home mar in, in the home market. I heard somebody say that under Euro European competition policy, even if all the funding and all the technology requirements had been there, a, a, a Google or an Amazon could not have could not have happened in Europe because it would have been killed by the competition authorities. I'm not advocating traditional industrial policy. Uh, uh, please don't misunderstand me. But we need to make sure that competition policy doesn't interfere with, uh, with innovation. But you have been, from what I heard, you have been um, with Angela Merkel in Israel, right? That is true, yes. Do you think that um, the government and especially Merkel is understanding and seeing what you see and will the government ever move in that direction or do we have to wait until we really have a chief scientist in the cabinet? Uh, I have over the past uh, uh, weeks and months I had uh, 
plenty of interaction interactions with with government people in Germany and other European countries, Asian Asian countries. My my impression is that let's say when we speak for the German side, that uh, this crisis was really a major wake up call for our politicians in that uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I had an opportunity to uh, uh, to interact with Ursula von der Leyen this uh, this morning. I mean, for instance, the uh, the EU has started a pledging conference for vaccine development, where they where they brought together eight, or they're bringing together eight billion on a global basis. I think the EU is going to uh, probably copy what the US is doing with BARDA. That's an, a, a, a vehicle to invest in innovation to address to address the crisis and so on. So um, I am cautiously optimistic. Ah, oh, that's good to hear. How about you, Klaus? Are you optimistic? Will, so, uh, so will, corona, will, corona, will Corona make everybody understand what is at stake, right? Will, that that we really need a bigger push in, for the tech ecosystem. Yeah, so look, at, at the beginning I was sort of, uh, I had some sympathy that it is an abstract thing if you are a politician and, and suddenly the internet comes along. Yeah, but le at, at latest, at the moment, then when they discovered that it is way more efficient to have a nice algorithm in in, in Facebook for uh, for for elections than gluing some nice pictures on some trees, uh, so you could have seen that um, uh, that technology is very very powerful. And um, I do believe that um, in general the the perception is now there. And ideally, they have to go into two directions. So one is the financing part, and I did already allude to it. But the other, for me, is system-critical infrastructures, uh, where you need to be aware which ones would you want to control and which ones um, you cannot lose. Yeah? To give you an example, if any of, any of us in Europe uh, doesn't want to touch cash anymore, so if we want to pay, we do that with MasterCard, Visa, or Amex. This is all U.S. technology, and it's a technological backbone in the U.S. So if that's suddenly taken away, we do not have consumer payments in Europe anymore. Is that something that, in terms of outer key to be the captain of our own face, something that we should strive for? No, I think it is a vulnerability that politicians should think of. And I'm sure that there are some more fields like this which, which deserve attention on, on, a, on, a, on a European scale. Okay, but then think a little bit more in that direction. What could a uh, outcome of this thinking process uh, look like? That, that you also look. If you say, look, if you look at, at India, for example, they when they introduced Paytm as a local uh, as a local platform, they made it mandatory that you put your social security number into it if you wanted to um, do your tax return. So suddenly, all the Indians were on Paytm. So I think the the state has a lot of of, of sit the situations where he could also be not, not just give money, but be part of of integrating technology in in, in their routines and, and and pushing this way certain certain uh, applications that we have. I've said that in the beginning, and, and we we have talked a little bit about technology, but I'm not really satisfied with um, what I've heard from you. And I know that you both are <laughs> real um, and visionary tech experts, so. Um, I, I would like to know um, from both of you, like two or three technologies you really find fascinating at the moment, something that keeps you awake at night, maybe or not, but um, and also something that really could play a bigger role in Europe. So um, Stefan, maybe start with you. So what exactly, maybe some, some company you have seen, some trend um, 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 you see, what is it? Well, let's say in, in, in biotech, um, it is it's clearly this mRNA technology that is so super hot right now uh, that can be used for vaccines uh, against uh, against corona that can be used in cancer treatments and so on. That's an area I would watch very, very closely. And there, there are several players coming up. There's still, there has been a lot of hype about CAR-T and so-called TCRs. These are cell-based cell-based therapies. I'm a bit concerned about Europe. For instance, China has, I think, 150 clinical trials with CAR-T and Europe has 15, but there are some very interesting uh, interesting uh, companies there. When it comes to the other business I'm very active in, semiconductor, we're deep into uh, quantum computing, and I think that uh, Europe has a chance to be 
uh, uh, to become a major player in this area. This is still very, uh, very early. Obviously, we have the Googles and everybody else in this uh, super active. But this is there are so many startups in quantum computing. We have with our venture fund, we have invested in uh, in uh, in se several of them. And a, a totally unrelated thing that I am uh, uh, very much in love with. Uh, and where uh, we have several important European players is in the food area. We are investing mm -hmm. in what is called future meat, i.e. that is make meat, real meat, but not from animals, but in uh, in cell culture. And you can do this with any type of meat, with any type of fish. And, the, uh, and it looks as if the, uh, the ecological impact of that is extremely, uh, extremely beneficial. Did you try that already? I've tried it. Uh, 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 I, I tasted one of the first burgers um, uh, that was made. This one burger cost at that time $250,000. <laughs> uh, and it tasted more like $2 or, or, <laughs> or, or so. But there is so much, uh, it's so much progress happening. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we can, you can make chicken. We, we now, we've, we've recently invested in a company that makes mozzarella. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, that way, uh, so to uh, to avoid that people have to eat baby mozzarella, it was a joke, obviously. Um, um, so uh, I think that also why why some people might find this this notion strange or even disgusting. I think there's a lot of future uh, in, in in food technology because if we want to make an impact on this. Uh, on the environment and uh, on this planet, we really need to think differently. How about you, Klaus? Yeah, <clears throat> it's funny that um, Stefan mentioned this food tech. Yeah, so um, I, <clears throat> I've been um, investing in the, into this for some time with um, Impossible Food or le same for leather um, and for dairies like with Modern Meadow or, and uh, <clears throat> Perfect Day. <clears throat> so I think this is, when I look at it on a helicopter perspective, there's always very big disruption when several trends come together. And in, in this field, you have clearly the um, cost for DNA desequenciation and the power of computers in then working with these kind of data and the cost of fermentation, where these three things come together and allow um, in, in some period of time that maybe proteins that are necessary to, to, to create food are cheaper from the artificial world that from the from the original world and that will will help mankind a lot so that i've been looking a little bit and i do think those kind of things europe is um um should have a, have a, uh, actually good chances but many stories in, in, in that field you hear from the united states right at the moment yes you hear from the united states yeah because they're they're faster maybe also they were more courageous and giving them a little bit more early more money um mm -hmm. but the, the advantage here is also that you do not have oligopolies that that um, that could be did a little bit like detrimental for for the growth of these kind of companies what does that mean look you you, you do not have uh, <clears throat> a, a oligopolistic power uh, that that can absorb a lot of the innovation and the new companies and make them their life a little bit more complex what, what company are you thinking of look i don't need to get into that one Okay. Yeah, so so uh, we do we we do have a, a few questions from the audience. Um, first one for you, Stefan. Um, what um, changes do you expect for the healthcare sector in Europe post COVID nineteen? So we did uh, get to that, but maybe a quick answer to that. Very interesting question. Yeah. So so I, I was mentioning that I think we need an upgrade of the public health uh, the public health sector. Uh, I, 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 uh, I'm not criticizing hospital privatization or that kind of thing. I think that's a nonsense, a nonsense discussion. But uh, the public health sector needs to be uh, 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 needs to be strengthened. We need to do something about data in uh, in healthcare. It is it, it shows of that it's of vital importance, uh, of vital importance right now. I have this hope, and maybe that's a bit uh, uh, motivated out of myself that people will focus more in on innovation on innovation in in health and i do think that we will have more focus on infectious disease you know the, the, that has the focus in research in many areas has gone uh, has gone away uh, has gone away from uh, from that we need to understand that we need to have a critical infrastructure 
Um, I, was, I was mentioning this before, what we call the white helmets instead of the uh, UN blue helmets. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the next pandemic may come. It may be mm. somewhat different. It's very likely that it will again be a respiratory virus. So we need to build up. Uh, we need to build up an infrastructure that can help us in this uh, in this area, whether that's in the military or in other in other institutions. Doesn't matter. Had we had we spent a couple of years ago, maybe a hundred million on such uh, such infrastructure, again, we would not have gone down into a fully fledged lockdown. And currently, I think we uh, we are losing more than a hundred million per hour. Yeah. Next question is a completely different topic, but I would um, like um, like to ask ask it to you as well. Um, the fear of making mistakes culture is killing um, any innovative spirit in in large German companies. One user wrote, "How can a board fo uh, truly foster an innovation culture when your ideas um, are seen as positive and making mistakes is not killing your career?" Um, it's a bit longer question, but I think that's the point, and I think. Um, you have some experience in your company with that. So give us an insight how innovation works at Merck. Well, you know, we were, let's say, if you go back a bit more than 10 years ago, we were a very traditional pharmaceutical and, and, and chemicals company. And we embarked uh, on a complete transformation process. We have defined corporate values. And these, these slogans always sound a little bit cheesy, but we really mean it. And we're saying we're curious minds dedicated dedicated to human progress. That means that we have joy in developing new things. Minds means we're rational and we want to do this for a <coughs> for a purpose. Uh, and, in, and then we've done a lot many things of opening up. We have opened uh, innovation centers in China very, very successfully. We have, I, I was talking about our venture funds. We have incubators, accelerators in Israel on the West Coast. And we embarked on a on a very serious digitalization uh, uh, effort, which helps us uh, helps us right now. Uh, we have founded several joint ventures. For instance, one with Palantir, it's called Syntropy, on managing cancer research data. We have moved this in the COVID crisis to be dedicated 100% percent toward, toward COVID research. And we have changed our organization. We have an innovation uh, organization, a business builder. An enterprise builder. We're spinning. We'll be creating an environment where individual employees who have ideas get funding, as if it was from a venture fund, and they can. How, build. how does that work? How does that work? That's interesting concept. And and, and it has provided. It has already provided significant financial uh, financial returns to us. I don't want to say that we are a superior company or something, but we have. We took. Uh, we took a conscious decision that everything in our company is about innovation and curiosity we are very financially minded at the same time we're very purpose we're very purpose minded and we think that the combination of this really helps because people want to obviously they want to make a career they want to have money they want to have some security what they want to work on something that is fun and mm -hmm. they want to work on something that is good for this world and if you try yeah. to combine this and be by no means perfect You can create a culture where you can overcome the inherent bureaucracy tendency that any large organization has. That sounds all good. But one thing you have to explain a little bit more, a, a culture where everybody can have an idea and make a business plan. How does that work? And well, what, what, what great ideas have come out of that? I mean, I could give you a couple of examples. We had uh, one young researcher. We're the leading company in making liquid crystals. You're looking at liquid crystals right now when you look at your computer screen. Uh, that researcher had the idea that you could use liquid crystal in the medical uh, in a medical area so that you can, for implant lenses, that you can use liquid crystals for which you then with a laser you can at any point in time adjust the vision. Uh, that is That was just a, a, a small idea five years ago, and we're now in negotiations with major corporations, and it's a big, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, I could give you dozens of uh, dozens mm -hmm. of such examples. It's often innovation is often about using a technology that is already established in one field, having a brilliant idea and applying it to something uh, to something totally different. Another user question, Klaus, um, I think that's best for you, is not any single company too small to compete with um, the big tech companies in China or the US. 
And um, the idea um, are next generation cooperatives of many European companies a possible solution? To well, compete that sounds pretty complex to me. Uh, so um, um, it has always been like that. Yeah. So and, and I've just this discussed with with Mike Morris from Sequoia. I mean, if you are afraid of of breaking uh, of of getting <clears throat> into competition with the big ones, then um, then then you don't shouldn't start because that will come and it has always been there. Um, the only difference might be where we need to make sure that we have a smart regulation if it becomes systemic. Uh, so, because if then, if you do have a, uh, you need to have platform neutrality um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and these kind of things are compulsory because if competition gets hindered on that end, then it is very structural and, um, and we need to make sure that there is a level playing field for all the innovations to succeed. Great. Okay. So we come to our last question already and um, I would like to know from you guys what um, Corona will change in your personal life, maybe with a tech perspective, but it doesn't have to be. What will stay after the crisis? Klaus? I think the, the likelihood of video conferencing and not flying so much, uh, which is basically driven like this. Really? Thing. There's the cohorts that oh, get minimized. I, I hate video conference because you can't walk around. Everybody, I mean, you know, if we would, would uh, talk at the phone, I could just stand up and nobody would wonder what I'm doing. So it depends on how much you fly. So I think historically, I would have argued that you can do video conferences after you've met the person the first time in real life. So then there is a there's a certain trust there. Um, Currently, we have swapped to video conferences only. We did investments where we didn't meet the founders in real life. And I do believe this is rather here to stay than to be an exception. Okay, we will see. Thank you very much. Stefan? So we, I have in my company, we have quite a few people who cannot work through video conference because they really make things. They have to be, they have to be physically there. And the majority of our colleagues has been has carried on uh, has carried on working so i didn't i couldn't spend all my time in, at the home office but i did and i was surprised how productive i was you know i i, I canceled all the meetings where i uh, where i participate more for decorative purposes or so uh, uh, i usually i travel to china once a month uh, i travel to the us once a month once a month and much other travel i can't be i can't give up that entirely but uh, for the past couple of weeks, I've spent the mornings in video conferences with Asia, the uh, midday video conferences with Europe, and the afternoons and evenings in video conferences with the, with the Americas. And I think I've achieved in these weeks more than I would achieve in months. Uh, in, in months uh, so. so I don't think it's completely sustainable, but I was, I was absolutely surprised how well that works. And I've become an expert at all these uh, video conference pl uh, platforms in the meantime. Thank you so much for all these insights and the good discussion. I think we have to um, go on at some point to talk again about it because the topic is so big. Um, I just say thank you and thank you for listening and for watching. And now I can um, I ask Steffi for some final remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really an inspiration. Insp this is my cat, Maui. Uh, <laughs> we both were listening and it was fascinating and it was inspiring. And thank you for your optimism. I'm, I'm, I copy this. I'm, I'm really, really, thank you for this great talk, my dear friends. See you on Wednesday. We have Albert Wenger and Isabel Welpe on the end of capitalism. Thank you for wow. this. What do you think? Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao.